Hey everyone, welcome to the Chain Chatter, a cross-chain roundtable where three founders talk about everything crypto, alpha, finance, markets, and their own road. Views expressed here are, at no, are not an endorsement by Leo Finance, and they are not financial advice and should be taken as informational only. Hello, Cal. Hello, Adrian. Hey, Joab. Uh, thanks for joining us here today. Um, I will give you a short introduction on uh, what this roundtable is about. Uh, but first, let's hear about the, the, the founders. Uh, what, what do you do? What's your DAP about? But mostly, what's your, uh, your own path? And how, how did you come into crypto? And uh, what is your vision for yourself, not, not your DAP, in five years? Cal, do you want to start, please? Yeah. Um, so I'm Cal. I'm the founder of Leo Finance. Um, we are building um, Web3 on, uh, on you know, various blockchains. Hive is at the core of them. Um, and then obviously we're working on uh, EVM chains like uh, BNB Smart Chain, uh, Polygon, uh, Ethereum, obviously. Um, and, you know, our, our goal is to democratize uh, finance and basically bring finance to a broader audience. And I think that narrative has become pretty clear, uh, especially since COVID, that, um, you know, more and more people want to get involved in finance, want to think about finance. And, you know, finance is and will always kind of be at the core of crypto and, and everything that goes on within crypto. Um, you know, I think the technology of crypto is, is interconnected with finance so clearly. Um, so Leo Finance is really just about bringing everybody together, um, you know, kind of like this podcast, kind of bringing everybody together from different, different walks of life, uh, different industries and, um, you know, sharing alpha, um, sharing ideas. Uh, so that's, that's a little bit about me and Leo Finance. And, you know, in the next 10 years, I uh, just kind of want to keep doing what we've been doing. I feel like um, this whole industry has gotten super interesting. Um, so, you know, meeting awesome people and, and learning more about different parts of the industry is just what I love doing. And uh, 10 years from now, I just hope to kind of keep, keep doing that. Yeah, I am pretty excited about what Leo Finance has in store in the next 10, 10 to 15 years. I'm here for the long run. And I just, re I just recently uh, heard about uh, Wombat. I was actually not familiar with the DAP. And I know that you have a lot of uh, DAPs built under this umbrella, Adrian. So do you want to tell the audience a little bit about it, please? Sure. Um, about Wombat and myself, um, I don't know. Uh, I'll, just, uh, I'll just start with <laughs> that, right? Um, so um, yeah, I'm Adrian. I'm the founder and CEO at Wombat or the company called Spielworks that runs Wombat and a few other things. Um, we actually started in 2018 um, building Wombat as a gaming platform because we strongly believe in blockchain and gaming as the combination and making or of ma for making games interoperable and basically giving back power to to gamers, right? Um, so um, Wombat has has launched as a wallet um, on the EOS IO blockchains in 2019, and ever since we've been building and expanding. We also run the Wombat Dungeon Master game, which is a top 15 game in terms of the use on DAP Raider. Um, it's an NFT staking game. It's really simple. Everyone can, can join. It's really nice. Um, yeah, that's uh, basically what we do. Our vision is to become the Steam for Web3, basically. We want to bring together gamers and games. And for me personally, maybe um, I've got I bought Bitcoin for the first time in 2013 at $90. So I got in very early, um, been, been in the space forever. Um, and I basically think for me uh, personally, um, blockchain is um, the a missing link that we've had or kind of a, the, the solution to a misdesign in the original internet, right? The original internet uh, allowed us to transfer and duplicate and replicate data. And what it doesn't, but what it didn't allow is to transfer scarce things or valuable things, right? So basically blockchain just fixes that because that wasn't possible before, at least not natively. So we had to build huge industries of middlemen, right? Um, like the PayPal's and banks and whatever. So my, um, my vision is basically that um, blockchain and crypto and decentralized um, value trans transmittable networks um, become ubiquitous in the internet and we will not use 
any any things like PayPal anymore to transfer value over over the internet. Yeah, wow, Bitcoin at twenty thirteen. That that's a great ride. <laughs> Drop it all. <laughs> Drop. Do you want to uh, give us a little bit about? Um, well, yeah, I, for sure. I I wasn't sure if you uh, so gift games. It's on top of Tesotopia, right? Oh well, just just go right. ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, our our company is Gift Games. Uh, we have games on the Tesos blockchain. Um, our flagship game is Tesotopia. Uh, it's the number one game on Tezos right now. I um, I got into blockchain pretty early. My background's a lot in design, illustration, marketing. I was creating Bitcoin wallets, and paper wallets, um, and you know designing those things early on. First crypto I ever bought was Dogecoin um, back in probably around 2013, 2014 also. Um, but obviously I didn't keep it. Uh, it was one of those things that uh, it was just fun to buy uh, a crypto at that point. And that was kind of the one that was like fun and exciting at that time. Um, got into the Tezos blockchain. Um, I was looking for really an opportunity there where we can cross NFTs and DeFi uh, kind of before this whole new term GameFi has come about. Uh, but it was during that kind of like DeFi summer of 2020 when everything was like YF moon, YF everything, YF whatever. And I was in a, in a group, I think it was like YF ape or something. And, and it just was like a small little community. And uh, we, we got to joking about an idea of like, well, what if we had yield farming NFTs where you just hold the NFT and like you just passively earn yield and it's emitting tokens that you use in the game and so we had this kind of idea and, and so i kind of sat on the idea probably for a couple of months developing it and like you know what would make the most sense and that's kind of how testatopia was born out of this this joke like we were going to call it yfo like ufo or something and so testatopia was born and uh it's set in outer space on a distant planet, but like you can have virtual blocks of land and they do emit tokens that you use in the game to build buildings, to repair your units and all that stuff. Um, long term for us, you know, we really started off as a as a blockchain studio. And for me, indie game development has been kind of like a hobby uh, for many years and now it's really becoming my main, you know, path of, of career and all that. Uh, and so we really want to turn into a game studio and have both that uh, blockchain element and game studio in house um, with you know illustrators and animators and everything all under the gift games umbrella. So yeah, really for me is building out that um, ecosystem that is started with Tezotopia and is turning out to be you know a couple other games that we are exploring and. Um, for us, truly, it's it's about cross-platform, cross-chain. Uh, we we love the idea of even a Web two player playing against somebody that's on chain, um, and, you know, having that that ability and technology to cross paths and, and do different things. Even with you know the idea of like someone on Tezos comes in, locks in their units and gets someone on Solana or something and they're all playing the same game. So really for us is that that vision of, of being able to cross platform, cross chain and have it all be cohesive. I think you might be muted, Eric. Yeah, I can't hear you, buddy. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like Every crypto project that knows what it is uh, right right now uh, is my migrating to gamify tokenomics. It, it's not just about the uh, well having good economics behind, but being able to gamify it. And the next step is to make cross chain collaborations or have na native tokens in several chains. So uh, this actually ta takes me to uh, and Adrian, if you want to start with this. How did you go from being a crypto newbie into becoming a founder and why blockchain? You already 
mentioned something about the missing link to replicate data, but why Web3 and not Web2, which is 10 times easier? It's a bigger challenge to go block uh, with a blockchainized project than a normal project. Uh, yeah, so. I'll start with a little anecdote, which I like to, to tell. Um, must have been back in 2003 or 2004 when I started studying at university, right? So long ago. <laughs> um, I, was, I was a big time gamer. Um, and uh, obviously online gaming became a thing. And one of the most popular games back then was Diablo 2. Um, I guess most of you still remember, right? And a friend, my, I was sharing flats with a friend and uh, we're like day and night just playing games. Um, and Diablo 2 was one of them, right? And then at some point we're like, uh, Dude, we we got uh, we we grind we grinded so hard here. We have so much gold. We have so much so, such a good equipment. Would be so cool if we could use the stuff that the gold from from grinding Diablo two, and kind of how somehow migrate that into this racing game that we were we were playing, right? And flip that into credits in that racing game and buy a better engine for our car, right? So we were essentially talking and. Um, yeah, like constructing this um, mentally, obviously, uh, just um, this um, game interoperability platform, right? So for us, that was like, oh, that would be so cool. Everyone would, would, would want that, right? Nobody would play anything else anymore because that's exactly what you want. So fast forward um, about like 15 years effectively, right? Um, yeah, I, I already kind of knew blockchain, right? And I... I knew that um, this has a lot of potential, but it was mostly like Bitcoin. And then I actually saw Ethereum come up um, in like 2014, I kind of ignored it. 2015, I couldn't anymore. And 2016, I, I thought, okay, that's not gonna go away, right? This kind of stuff. But first I basically just, just thought about kind of more of these financial applications, right? Um, and then 2017, when when NFTs became a thing with CryptoKitties and stuff, I said, okay, I got to found something around, around blockchain and gaming, right? We got to, we got to go there because it's going to be huge. It's going to be the next, the next shift in, in gaming. And this is finally basically effectively doing what I want to do, wanted to do back then 15 years back. Right. So now we're talking 2018 um, uh, when I, when I founded the company that now is called Spielworks and that now runs, runs Wombat. Um, I realized that this is actually becoming true with blockchain, right? You, you will have this interoperability and um, we can obviously talk about all kinds of types of interoperability because it's not just, yeah, you can use this one item that you have in this one game and, and basically also use it in the other. That's, just, that's not really a blockchain problem, right? Um, but um, I, I really realized that it's, it's becoming so much easier through blockchain to actually have this cross-game interoperability and that games become interconnected and that um, there's a lot of stuff that you can do with that on the on, on the financial level obviously on a uh, in-game level but also on a, on a social level right and on a kind of how how well can you show off right and um, uh, yeah and that that what that's what really fascinated me I've, i had been a founder already i was running a, a software service company since 2013 um, and but in, tw in late 2017, beginning of 2018, I, sa I said, I need to set up a separate entity to just take care of all things blockchain and, and like really drive that. So um, there was a good time. Berlin was uh, basically the, the some, one of the capitals of, of the blockchain movement uh, back in 2017, 2018. So, uh, we're, we're still based in Berlin. Um, so yeah, that's, that's how I, I became a founder in the blockchain space. Wow, yeah, and one of the things that blockchain offers is that you don't actually have to speak with the with the CEO of a company to to do some collaborations. You just have to mi migrate or connect both blockchains to have in interoperability. So, yeah, it's 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 just so much easier. Joao, do you have anything to add to this? How did you go from being a crypto newbie into being a, into becoming a founder? And why blockchain and Web three instead of Web two? Yeah, so so like I'd mentioned, uh, I was pretty much like a hobbyist uh, game developer, uh, making HTML5 games and stuff like that. Um, and even way back in high school, I, I would work on like Half-Life mods and uh, creating maps for Counter-Strike and, you know, different games like that. So I was, you know, always 
been something that I wanted to endeavor to do, but life took me another route. And, you know, I professionally became more of a marketing person and design um, background. And so I saw a huge opportunity with um, NFTs and, and DeFi, um, and especially putting my skills as a as illustrator uh, and marketing person to use uh, in this space. So I saw the opportunity there and really uh, started to put together a team, put together a plan and uh, saw the opportunity on Tezos last year when we launched in 2021. Um, we saw, a, you know, really a, a community that was, was hungry for new projects. We saw a tech that was always evolving. And, um, and so we, we decided to, to launch on Tezos and launch this game as a, essentially a proof of concept. And uh, yeah, it's been a, been a fun journey since then. It's been a great supportive community in Tezos and, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty much changed my career path and life path uh, as far as like what I'm doing now. Um, so yeah, all, all good stuff. It's been a, a one hell of a journey this year, actually, uh, finding being a first time founder and figuring out, you know, how to fundraise and figuring out, you know, what, what's worth time, what's worth money to, to invest in and, and, you know, what's best for the company. So it's, it's been a year of learning a lot of, you know, those, those founder, uh, I guess, first mistakes and all that stuff. But I think we, as a company and, you know, as a founder, I think we're getting through uh, the toughest part of the market. And I feel like we'll be much better off on the other side of it. Um, I, I did have a question, you know, what, what, uh, for Wombat, uh, what, uh, what change are you on right now or what change do you support? Um, we originally started on EOS IO chain. So back in 2018, when we started, we thought that Ethereum won't scale, right? And it still isn't. <laughs> so um, uh, EOS launched back then, and EOS looked really, really good for gaming, right? Um, and so we originally launched an EOS, and then obviously we also added more EOS IO chains. And only two years ago, we actually started integrating with EVM chains. So now we also support EVM chains. We're not like a meta mask, so you can't like add your own chain or whatever, right? We make it more user-friendly and stuff, um, but we support kind of the major uh, EVM-based chains. Um, we don't support Tezos just yet, um, but if there is more games, then we'll obviously do that. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Carl, so why Web3 and not Web2? If like, I know Leo Finance has a lot of com competition on uh, Web2, so tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, um, you know, when it comes to especially stuff with social media, um, obviously that's essentially the definition of Web2 is, um, you know, the advent of pl platforms like Twitter and um, Facebook and, and you know, basically their adoption and scale. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, with Web3, it kind of solves for a lot of the issues that are that are Web2 related in terms of, uh, and, you know, I'm just kind of pinpointing social media only right now. Um, but essentially, um, a lot of the issues that that stem from Web2 are um, related to control uh, and money. So uh, if you look at a platform like Facebook, which is famous for, you know, their run ins with the government, um, they are essentially looked at as, as a information monopoly. And they're using user generated content to build kind of this this business of scale. And they're also using it to influence society. So what a lot of big governments don't like about that is, you know, this one, this one corporation that has a lot of control over what's heard, what is said, um, and everything, you know, related to that. Uh, then you've got all these issues with Twitter and, you know, people getting platform banned and, and stuff like that. So there's kind of this finance component and a information uh, and immutability component. So uh, in my opinion, the solution to a lot of these things is, is Web3. Um, so you take blockchain uh, and, and, for example, you have one account where on that blockchain you can log in uh, to social media apps and nobody can delete that account because it's, it's written on the blockchain, right? You can't, unless, it, unless the chain forks, you can't get removed. Um, and even in that case, you can, you know, you'll still live on the old fork. Um, so there's a, lot of, there's a lot of things that blockchain and Web3 solve for. Um, 
in, in those regards. So in my opinion, the future of social media is uh, going to be on Web3. It's uh, going to be immutable. It's going to be tokenized. Um, and, you know, I didn't really dive into the finance part of it too much, but the, the finance component is that a platform like Facebook, Twitter, uh, you know, Instagram, they got rich because of user generated content without the, without the UGC, they would not have the, the, uh, financing that they have. So what I'm fascinated with is taking that model of, you know, ad revenue and, and the other forms of revenue that they have. And instead of making a corporation rich, make the people who are creating the UGC rich. So, you know, if, if all the users can share in the platform's growth and adoption, I think that's far more, uh, far better for the world than, you know, a company like Facebook, just collecting a bunch of wealth and, you know, maybe employing, you know, maybe it's great that they employ tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of people. But if you can build a platform at Facebook scale, tokenize it and give the power to all the people who use it and create the content and ultimately get it adopted. Um, I think that's a lot better for the world. Um, and, you know, basically the distribution of wealth, I think, um, can be helped a lot in those ways. Yeah, that's one of the counter arguments most people have against Facebook and Twitter. Like, why, why are you creating content there if you're not getting any revenue from your pictures, from your from your views? From Well, YouTube has that, Instagram has, has that, but you have to be a big user and you have to have a lot of views to actually monetize that. So, yeah, uh, going to, to into another topic. Uh, so, Wombat and... And Teresotopia, you are uh, Wombat is a top 10 DAP. Uh, Teresotopia, it, it's a top top one game on your own blockchains. So Leo Finance, it's probably the, co the community with more users uh, in terms of, co of layer two community created uh, blogging platforms. So uh, how do you deal with it with investor relationships and how do you assess collaborations with other projects or with other blockchains when when do you decide to go venture capital how do you decide to go with your own funds uh like how how did you achieve this this size uh drop do you want to start with this yeah sure um we we're very fortunate to have an incredibly supportive community in Tezos and uh, we've been self-funded since the onset. Uh, we are now looking for venture capital to see ourselves through the bear market um, to be able to continue to build and push out the technology, the games, um, because we know that on the other side of it, it's going to be you know rainbows and butterflies. And, It'll be great. I mean, it's 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 at the point right now where, of course, investors are frustrated, um, but it is really for us in our experience. It's really turning uh, our head to what's the right strategy to onboard new users. What's a long term strategy? You know, I feel like during the bull market, it was great and. Uh, it was very easy to to bring in new users and uh, to generate activity on our marketplace and all that. Um, but and, and our whole focus really was targeting crypto enthusiasts, crypto you know centric uh, uh, users. And so now we are essentially branching out and uh, figuring out ways to onboard you know, traditional gamer, a web two gamer, uh, you know, a web two individual that, you know, has never touched the blockchain. And how do we do that is, you know, essentially uh, a user journey where they're playing the game and they're playing against a blockchain person, but they don't have to know that, right? Like they don't have to buy an NFT. They don't have, they could have a, you know, a free unit or a free, you know, uh, item in the game and still fight, you know, against a blockchain person. And so um, there's a journey there that we're, we're exploring where the Web2 individual will become a free-to-play version and then earn an NFT down the road. Or you know, as they level up and rank, then, you know, they can unlock something and then, you know, potentially be converted into a, a Web3 player. Um, but it, it has really 
change their focus on user acquisition and what the right approach is. And so exploring that as a, as a company and just um, ensuring in it, that our community, which is mostly crypto investors and uh, those individuals, yeah, there was a lot of shouting when the market was coming down and everybody was essentially worried about, you know, well, my block of land is now uh, worth much less than it was three or four months ago. And um, it's hard, to, you know, in those moments to kind of, you take the flat, you know, you, because uh, you're sure the whole market's come down, but somehow it's the project's fault. <laughs> um, yeah. But, you know, it's, it's, it's something that, you know, we have to, as leaders, you know, lead and, and, and show, you know, what the full vision is. And, um, it helped them understand that, hey, we are a game studio. We're, our first priority is to make fun games. And, you know, it's not to just be churning out NFTs and money and all that stuff. Like, uh, you invested in this, you know, and you invested in it because you believed in a project. And so, uh, keep, keep the faith and, and believe that, you know, the strategy and the approach that we're taking for the future is, is going to be the right approach. Um, I think the best that you can do is tell your, you know, crypto investors that have bought the NFTs or purchased your blocks of line and all that. Um, but then you have the other element, right? You have the, the people that just want to play the game that just think it's fun. And, you know, they bought the cheapest NFT there is and they're just playing with that. Right. And so, uh, yeah, so there's this balance that has to occur and that is happening right now. Um, of like which which group of people because this is a whole new category right it's 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 crypto gaming it's it's completely new you know it's you know you got the crypto investors and then you got the gamers and investors don't really care about the game so much they they care about <laughs> their nft getting flipped you know and, and making money off of it uh, whereas a gamer wants a fun game. And so I, I feel like there's more gamers out there. And if the game succeeds with gamers, the crypto investors succeed. So, I mean, in the end, we still have to make fun games. We still have to make uh, creative ways to, to, to bring in new users. It's, it's all about the game. Um, and if the game succeeds, everyone succeeds. So that's the path we're taking and that's you know that's the road we're going down it's just continually improving the game and continually creating fun games um because that's really what we're here that's what it's all about yeah and i think that one of the biggest obstacles for uh web3 is you not only have to teach people how to play your game or how to use your app you actually have to teach them what the hell is going on with blockchain and with uh markets and all that so they understand that if the prices go down, it's not about your app. It's about probably the whole market. So Adrian, do you want to uh, chip in? Um, <clears throat> definitely, there's so much to say on that. Um, I mean, we are VC funded as well, right? Um, so we did our seed round actually in the last bear market or at the bottom of the last bear market actually. Um, in 2020, early 2020, when the COVID crash happened, right? And um, <clears throat> because you don't build anything like a Web3 gaming platform, like kind of a Steam for Web3 without a lot of funding, right? You can't do that because it, it inherently needs a lot of scale, right? And then in 2020 also, um, we, we, we had a lot of users already, but they we had no content, right? So uh, we had, we grew to, 350,000, 400,000 users in the first half of 2020. And we were this gaming focused wallet, let's say, right? Um, for Web3 games, but there were no Web3 games. Nobody was building Web3 games. There was like 10 games that you could actually play. And that was it, right? Um, yeah. and, and it was ridiculous. So then we started to take a detour, which made us grow even, even faster, even larger, um, because we started onboarding Web2 games and basically built this layer of blockchain of, of crypto and NFTs on top of traditional Web2 games, right? So that way we could actually bridge from the Web2 to the Web3 world and actually attract real gamers to, to the Web3, right? And so we've grown to over 3 million users now. Um, and 
um, you obviously have to have a lot of, yeah, financial, but also other, uh, other stamina for that, right? So you need to push through. And um, now obviously we've got into the next bear market and we launched our token in this bear market, right? So in, in July, we launched our token, um, the Wombat token. And um, we, again, deliberately actually chose to launch it in a bear market, right? Because we, we saw a lot of opportunity in that because so many people are not interested in just or in the next hype, right? And we, there's so, so much less noise now that um, you actually get a lot more people who are genuinely interested in the, the gaming aspect of things rather than the get rich quickly schemes, right? So, um, and that's what we want to do. We want, obviously, like with to to uh, tokenization, you want to give power back to the people, right? Um, so you want them to participate both from a governance aspect, but also ideally financially um, on the long run. Um, and that may or may not turn out well, right? I mean, people who have been in the Steam or Hive community early on, I remember those days when the Steam token was, I think, $7 back in 2017, right? And um, then everybody yeah. got, got really, got really uh, anxious when it started going down because they had invested so much time and maybe money and energy into that and it never recovered ever since, right? Um, and uh, but, but the people who st still stick around, these are the real people. These are the ones that who really believe in it and who really like see the value of it outside of just the financial value, right? And so I think that bear markets and, and um, these downturns are actually quite, quite healthy because it's not just about the height, it's about the substance and the people who still stick around. These are the, the real ones that you wanna have, right? Um, so yeah, um, we basically, what, like, because you asked the question about funding as well, right? Um, we didn't want to continue going the pure VC route anymore because um, we think that the things that we're building are so inherently mm, tailored towards having this kind of participation that um, we definitely wanted to go the token route, right? And um, this will, I think, also make us much, much stronger going forward because everyone will have kind of their stake into the, the thing that they're using. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, Carl, do you wanna chip in on this? Yeah, no, I mean, I just to kind of piggyback off of uh, what Adrian said, it's kind of a, bear markets are like the great filter. They, um, you know, they basically filter out the people who are using, you know, Web3 in, in all shapes and forms uh, from the people who are, who are here to just kind of get rich and, and uh, focus on token values. So, um, you know, I, I always love when people talk about, you know, when people who know what they're talking about, talk about, um, you know, bear markets and bull markets, because uh, what you see a lot of, especially around Twitter and, and other places where a lot of crypto people gather is uh, people complaining about, you know, the prices going down. And um, basically they're complaining that they're not rich. They're like, uh, you know, they, they thought they were on their way to buy a Lambo and now uh, they'd be lucky to buy a Honda. Um, and then people get, get upset about that. Uh, so the funny thing, the funny thing about that is that, um, you know, if you pay attention to people who aren't just, you know, noisemakers, um, what they're saying is the, you know, fortunes are made during the bear market and they're collected during the bull market. So, you know, and I'm sure Adrian knows that buying Bitcoin back in 2013, he's been through every sort of cycle you can imagine. And, you know, he, he didn't get rich by buying at the top of the bull market uh, in any, in any case, you know. He, uh, he and, and anyone else in, the, in these types of markets, you know, really, really hammered down, banned down the hatches and built their portfolio and their business uh, during these more, you know, lean winter times. Um, and then, you know, they, they reap what they sow in the, uh, in the bull market. So I, I love this stuff because it's a great filter. It's a great way to find out who your real community is, uh, like you were saying, and it, it's a, uh, you know, it, it can be a really fun time if you make it a fun time uh, to build and, and get ready for the future. Yeah, and one one thing that uh, strikes me as very interesting is that um, right now during this 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 kind of winter, I've seen many uh, apps, well, apps growing and uh, just just keeping building and. 
So I have this, this question for you. So you are all self-funded or started as, as self-funded. So this is not going to be financial advice whatsoever, but how the hell did you achieve this? Like tell the audience how to find alpha, how to assess projects, how, what's your process for, uh, for being where you are right, right now. So you three are, are running very successful projects and you three are, uh, well, you know how, how the market works. So I'm not asking you to tell, to, to give the audience the, the key to being rich, but what's, what's your own process for finding alpha for assessing projects for, for knowing when to buy, when, where, where to buy and what to buy. So Carl, do you want to start with this? Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, it, naturally I find a lot of my alpha on Leo finance, you know, it's kind of one of the main reasons why, uh, you know, we started it back in the day, uh, was really just to kind of create a gathering place where people could share stuff like that. Um, so it's kind of my natural, my natural go-to where I, where I kind of get an initial look at a lot of different things that are happening in the crypto space. Um, and then, you know, from there, I, I, I basically take a, take a project and I'll, uh, look through a lot of different things. Um, you know, I think white papers are great and I, I like reading white papers. Um, I'm definitely a, a long form content kind of person, you know, whether it's a podcast or, um, you know, it, like a book or, you know, reading an article, I, I prefer that over short form. Um, so I love that, but, but I do think white papers are a great place where projects can dress themselves up, um, where you really want to look to, to, you know, kind of get to the meat of a project is what the community says and what uh, their team is actually doing. So what I love to do is, is kind of dig through the actual activity behind a team. Um, you know, if they have a public GitHub, I love, I love seeing their commits and seeing how active it is. Um, and if, if they don't, and it's, you know, a different type of project, um, you know, I like looking at where the team's updates are, you know, how coordinated they look um, and things like that. I think I think a lot can be said for both community and leadership. Um, those two things are kind of the biggest contributing factors to a successful crypto project. Um, really, a lot of crypto projects just are aiming to not die during the winter and build so that, you know, kind of like what I was saying in my last point, build so that they can reap the rewards in the, uh, in the bull market. Um, so I would say a lot of it, a lot of it comes down to, um, you know, how fragile a, a project is. So if you can find a project that isn't fragile and you can find a project that has kind of these core characteristics, uh, you might be on to something. So, you know, a big one for me, and I have no relation to them is, is Thorchain uh, with the Rune token. I, I love what they're building and I love uh, what they have going on. And a, a lot of why I've invested so much in that project is uh, because of what I see their team doing, what I see their community doing and saying, um, and that's really how I assessed it. And, you know, I've been, I've been buying it for probably almost three or four years now. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think alpha, alpha is everywhere in crypto. That's kind of the cool thing. You, you never know when you're going to find some. Um, so when you find it, um, take advantage of it. And uh, that's, really, that's really how I got my, my nutshell in, in crypto. Yeah. Uh, Job, you, you also mentioned that you started uh, as a self-funded company. So do you want to share your, your take on this? How do you find alpha? What, how do you assess the markets, other projects, not financial advice? Sure. Yeah. Um, I, I think for me, a lot of it is, is uh, with social engagement. Um, it's stuff like Lunar Crush, where you can see, you know, what's, getting a lot of action on Twitter or getting a lot of action on, you know, so other social media platforms. Um, that was really how uh, we came up deciding to use it as a blockchain because we were seeing NFTs on the rise. Uh, we also were first to market on Tesla's blockchain as, as a game. So for us, we saw that opportunity and being first to market uh, with, gaming NFTs allowed us to really self-fund and, and created a, a nice runway for us. Um, that's, you know, led us through, um, you know, and it's, and still, you know, still uh, got a runway for us, but uh, yeah, I, I think for me, it's just really looking at those signals on social media, you know, what are people talking about? Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I've, I've rolled into a, an alpha Discord channel now and then, but like, you know, that you take all that with a grain of salt. Like, uh, yeah. some of that stuff's bullshit or just like one guy trying to pump his token or whatever. So, you know, all that stuff, you know, with a grain of salt. But I think the real metric is is seeing, you know, the numbers on social media and, and um, seeing where the trend is and uh, especially just, you know, just following you know, what's what's new, what's fresh and and uh, what people are talking about. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think Lunar Crush is kind of one of my resources for I guess alpha in a sense, but you know, it's, it's a great resource. Yeah. I, I was, I was 18 when, uh, Bitcoin went out and, uh, I, I never bought and I own, I only bought until 2017, but wow. Buying in 2013, Adrian, you have a lot of experience finding good, good, good opportunities. Um, do you want to chip in? Actually, in early 2013, at $90, Bitcoin felt super expensive already because I was watch uh, back then I was already watching it for a few years, right? So first time I came across Bitcoin was in 2011 through online poker communities that basically where people were selling 1,000 Bitcoin for $300, right? But no exchanges, right? You would have to send $300 to some random person that you met on a forum via PokerStars and then you may or may not get back your 1,000 Bitcoin, right? It was crazy. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure whether I'm a good indicator in terms of when to buy and how to buy and how to get alpha. And um, uh, But to me, what I always look for is, is adoption or the potential for adoption, right? That's, that to me is kind of the, the biggest driver for my decisions. And um, so... If, for instance, you look at um, the, the metaverse space, right, and the the, the games there, that um, also you see that um, what what uh, the Sandbox have done in the Central Land and Upland and stuff, they 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 got so big through um, their their partnerships, right? So that that is adoption, right? That is um, kind of real world adoption. Even if if there's very few people actually playing the games just yet, um, I would still bet on on these kinds of um, metaverse place to be more more um, successful than maybe technologically a, um, superior up and coming new metaverses, but they don't have any kind of um, ties into the real world into kind of a- adoption into like that that's that's what what's been driving me. That's why I wanted to found a company because I wanted to drive real world adoption to blockchain, right? And um, that's why that's why I always look out for for kind of what are the drivers of adoption? And um, yeah, that can be that can be partnerships with kind of non Web three uh, companies, or it can be uh, a lot of users from from the web kind of traditional space or whatever it is. That's why I also think that generally something like Crypto.com has a good chance of surviving and also thriving. Um, like something like not, not not saying that maybe they're Ponzi, maybe whatever people are saying, right? Um, but uh, th- this is what I what I typically look out for. You're muted, Eric. Yeah, I think you're muted again, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. I, I I just keep hearing my my own voice on on Discord, so I just muted. Sorry. Uh, yeah, it's just golden. All of this advice, and uh, I actually want to take this this chance to ask you as uh, successful DAP founders. Uh, for the audience mainly, what is your uh, top recommendation for someone who wants to start a project and for someone who wants to get into blockchain uh, dApps? What what would you tell them, uh, Joab? Um, I'd say, you know, test the waters with a, with a project that's not too ambitious, right? Um, if you want to, you want to get your feet wet. Uh, have a plan. Have a good plan. Uh, if you're like me, where you're more the creative director of the project, find a trusted developer um, to to kind of get things off the ground. And yeah, I mean, you got if you're going to be a founder, you you got to find your co-founders as well. I mean, nothing great is done alone. 
you have to depend on other people to put together the, the other pieces. And so you can't do it all alone. Um, you know, just first step, admit that. And then uh, <laughs> put a plan in place and, and really get going with that plan. And I feel like taking small steps uh, at first to, to achieve the greater goal. Um, don't get too ambitious too early and just take it one day at a time and don't let the pressure really eat you up because there's another day you know, after today. There's another week after this week and you'll always keep building and keep going. Adrian, before Wombat, you were, uh, you, you mentioned you were um, managing another company. So you have some, some experience there. Uh, what, what's your main advice for someone who wants to create a company or to start a startup or to create a DAP? It's funny because uh, when I ran my, my uh, IT services, software services company, I had a lot of people approaching me, hey, can you build that? Can you do that, right? Um, you, you and your team, you could probably build that, right? And I was like, yeah, sure we can, but why, right? Tell me, like pitch me why I would build that with you. And uh, most of the time people were actually struggling really putting their vision and their, um, their concept into, into like live, even, even if it's just talking about it, right? Even if it's just showing something and um, so that, that, that it's still the same, right? Uh, people always think, they tend to think that they can't do something because they don't have the resources in terms of developers, in terms of, um, yeah, I'm being blocked by this. But the most important thing is to get started, right? You should get started. So in, 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 this, in this Web3 world, it's so much easier than before to actually get started, right? It, originally, it was super hard, but nowadays we have a lot of cool tooling. You can basically just create your NFT collection, right? You can distribute that to others. You can collaborate with other, others. You don't have to be an artist, but artists obviously have a, are having a great time in the NFT space. Um, and you can basically just do fun things with tokens, or you don't even have to know what a smart contract is to set up your own token, right, um, nowadays. So it's, it's, it's really cool. You can do so many things with crypto and NFT stuff on, without even coding a single line of code. And um, I think this is where everyone should just get started, right? Just find a concept, find, like, build your own world of what you want to build with, um, within the space, like, find your niche, find your community and start talking about your things and start developing your idea and move on from, from where you are. It, typically, as Joab said as well, if you're super ambitious with your idea, you're probably not going to get there, right? Because it also probably is going to change at least three or five times on the way, right? Um, you, you will probably, like, especially in this space, you will probably not know what's going to come out at the end. When, when I first started, I didn't, I didn't know that what, what I'm building now, that this is what I would be building, right? Um, and that's totally fine. I think it's, it's, it's not like that for, for most of the people who are building a Web3 space. So it's the most important thing is just get started. Don't wait. Don't wait for a better opportunity. Don't wait for a better market. Don't wait for better people. Just get, get going. You'll find people. You'll find the people that, you'll be, that you want to work with. You'll find people who want to work with you. You'll find, like, if you do great things, other people doing great things will find you. Yeah, and I think that's a good point. I mean, just to be flexible. Because you do, you do find yourself pivoting a lot and changing really the, the vision as things progress and, and as it, the technology advances so quickly in this space. That's also another thing that you have to stay on your toes and be able to evolve. Yeah, 50% is just starting. Uh, Kyle? Yeah, you know, I think, I think resilience is... Uh, probably the number one uh, thing I would tell anyone who's who's starting something in crypto um, who are, I mean, not even just crypto, but if you're starting anything really, um, you know, being able to kind of weather the storms and um, be a little malleable, kind of, kind of piggyback on what you guys are talking about is, you know, a, a tree in the wind, uh, you know, when the wind is high and the pressure's on that tree breaks, if it's, if it's too stiff. But if you can be a tree that's uh, flexible, if you can be a little malleable, if your vision, um, you know, it, you, you, you should have a vision that's very strong, but at the same time, be very quickly willing to change that vision. Um, you know, kind of like you said, I, I 
when I got started with all this stuff, I would have never imagined doing what I'm doing now. Um, it, it looked a lot different. The vision was a lot different. Um, the general, I would say the general thesis was still there. You know, uh, like I said, the, the thesis was to democratize finance and, and make it more accessible to people. But how we would achieve that vision has completely changed from where it started. Um, and if I were to be too rigid and too uh, stiff in my views on it, uh, you know, the project probably would have died long ago. So I think a big, a big key step for any founder, especially, you know, crypto is just kind of amplifying that, but, but any founder anywhere is to be malleable and be willing to, uh, to change your ideas on the fly, uh, when you see things that are, that are potentially better than you had originally, uh, set out to achieve. So, um, yeah, I think, I think it's, I think it's also great if you can look for another co-founder, uh, like Joe, I was saying, it's it's amazing when you can kind of find someone who shares a vision with you and who has capabilities that you don't have. It's uh, it's a pretty rare thing to find someone who can do everything. So, um, you know, everything from marketing to development to financing, it's pretty rare to find someone who can do all of those things. But um, it's a lot less rare and a lot more uh, achievable to find two or three or four people who can do all of those things. Uh, so I think it's, I think it's really incredible when you can, when you can put that together. Yeah. It's just amazing for, uh, well, to me to, to see a blockchain project with 30, 40 team, team members, that just means that they know how, how to handle growth, uh, which is something that, uh, I don't think that many blockchain entrepreneurs know, know how to, how to achieve. So, uh, guys how how do you handle growth and how do, how do you handle a, a good roadmap that it's at the same time feasible but ambitious uh adrian do you want to uh go more in depth into this um again i'm not sure but i'm a good person to give give tips on that because i'm super impatient i always want to do so much more than what we're actually capable to do um and so I, I keep driving the team crazy, right? We're, we're 30 people actually nowadays, and um, we tend to do too, way too much, right? So um, yeah, it's, it's hard to manage that. It's hard, and the most important lesson that you have to learn is not what to do, but what not to do, right? Um, so you have to basically focus, you have to cut down because um, I mean, now that, that's also why I like the, the, the bear market um, because there isn't that much opportunity and that, that there isn't that much noise, right? In the bull market, you have 10 people approaching you every day with some crazy ideas that you could all do, but you can't, right? Because you don't have the, the means of doing everything. So you have to cut down on certain things and it makes your decision process much, much harder because there are so many opportunities. In the bear market, you don't have, you still have a lot of opportunity, obviously, but uh, it's, it's not as bad. So it's actually easier to make choices and it's easier to say no. And it's easier to like uh, focus on, on what you actually want to do. But I guess that this is the most difficult thing is to basically decide what you don't want to do and instead focus on, on, the, on the stuff that's really important for yourself. Rob, do you want to uh, chip in? Yeah, yeah, I'm also on Adrian's sentiment of being impatient and very much on the same boat. Um, we, we started out the 2022 roadmap really ambitious of like, oh, we're going to launch these mini games. We're going to have all this stuff. And cut to May 2022. We've delayed the play to earn element after like five months. We're not be able going to be able to build these mini games. But at this point, it's like, yeah, what, what are the things uh, that you can accomplish and, and stay realistic with that? Um, and as you're scaling, uh, for us, we've started to, because we are, you know, developing games, uh, to kind of silo off teams in a sense of like, okay, your whole focus is Tezotope, uh, your whole focus is Matter Life, um, and, you know, your whole focus is, you know, Lorcan or other game. And so, like, uh, finding the talent and the leaders within your team as well um, to to be able to trust that they can handle putting all that together and they can handle getting that game design and that whole development on the road that it needs to be on. Uh, 
being able to just trust, you know, the leaders within your team uh, to make the right decisions is, is a huge part of the scaling as well. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think for us, that this, that that's one of the major lessons for, for me as a founder here in 2022. Um, it's being able to dele delegate more and you know, hand off a project uh, to to somebody that's a clear leader on the team. Um, yeah, so yeah. find your leaders I'll, and utilize them. Yeah, so, I uh, you know, kind of interesting um, interesting contrast to that is that I you know one of the one of the biggest lessons I've learned throughout uh, this year has been to to try and delegate more things and and bring more people into the fold of things that I would normally uh, want to be spearheading myself um, and just kind of letting letting people run run with things on their own um, you know finding I would say I would say something amazing is if you can find people who are who are self-directed on your team um, so you know it's actually it's actually a burden and, and there's been people on the team that, you know, I I've removed from the team um, who are a little bit too, uh, who, who require basically a lot of direction. So uh, these are people where, you know, before they take any step, they want permission or they want, um, you know, basically clear guidance on what exactly to do step by step. And those people tend to be more of a burden than, than, you know, um, a, a contributor to the project and, and the vision. Um, so I would say one of the, one of the most important things you can do as a, as a leader, as a person hiring, uh, hiring talent is to search for the quality of people who are, who are, um, ambitiously self-directed. So find people who can say, not only buy into your vision, but then actually take that vision and, and, and run with it and basically say, okay, you're in charge of. Um, you're in charge of marketing or you're in charge of developing this aspect of the project and say, um, you know, this is the end state that I want. This is what I desire. And uh, that person just goes off and does, you know, X, Y, and Z to achieve it every single week. Um, I think that's a really special talent. Um, I don't necessarily think that that's something you'd teach anybody. I think, I think a lot of people inherently have that, have that ability to ask for forgiveness rather than permission. Um, and I think those people are, are really special. So when you find one that's like that, uh, hold on to them, bring them closer, uh, find ways to integrate them more, more and more into the project. Um, to me, that's, that's the number one quality I look, look for in people these days. Yeah. Uh, okay. So there's, there's a question from the, from the audience, uh, and I, I find it pretty in interesting. So uh can you share with us some private roadmap plans like if you wanted to get hyped anyone who's who's listening can you share anything that you haven't really uh, shared with anyone else or that you have in the back burner or that you want to see happening uh in the next few months do you want to start adrian oh my god <laughs> <laughs> that's always um, the most fun question to get um we have a lot of things on our roadmap that we have basically communicated, but we're not talking about it that much, right? So not, not constantly. And this is kind of a, a common mistake that we're making because we're so German. So we don't, we don't, we tend to not talk about our stuff too much. So um, I guess the, the most important thing is something that we had on our roadmap for Dungeon Master. You know, we just started season six of Dungeon Master. Um, and so it's 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 been a while already. It's almost a year old the game, um, and we have about like twelve thousand users who played it since since the season started yesterday actually. Um, and now we're we want to double down on this, right? So we want to be we want to enable people to create their own um, rules and to create to basically run their own dungeons. And this is what this is what's what's going to be the, the next big thing for Dungeon Master specifically, right? Where um, we enable like what what Cal was was talking about, you kind know, of user user generated content and and own, like also also user owned content, right? And um, I think that's the power of metaverses, and that's um, that's also something that we want to enable and we want to leverage as well for our community, so that they can actually like 
make their own rules and and uh, run their own stuff. So that that's that's kind of the biggest thing that's been kind of hidden on the roadmap, and we we kind of spoke about that that, that it was called kind of the multiple dungeons feature. Um, and, but but we never kind of really spoke about how that what that's going to look like. And this is what we're currently frantically working on um, to to actually come up with a concept and come up with a plan and come up with with kind of a real um, yeah directed roadmap uh, for for this feature. Uh, it's more it's going to be more of, more than a feature. It's actually going to be kind of it's almost like an entirely new game. Yeah, job. Do you want to get us hyped? <laughs> Uh, we are uh, going to launch a game on Solana, so we'll be venturing out of Tesla um, and launch on Solana with the ambition to have it be a cro our first cross-chain game. Um, so that's, I mean, that's not the biggest secret. We've already announced that and kind of put that out there, but uh, that is something coming up on our roadmap. And on the private roadmap, we are launching on an, on an app store. We're launching Tezotopia. Uh, on an app store, which I can't name yet, but uh, we will be uh, putting out a essentially a web two version, web two point five, I guess, version of Tezotopia on an app store in this this quarter. How? What about the yeah. finance? <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> it's uh, it's always fun because I I'm like the uh, you know we we run an AMA every week called the when soon show because everyone always asks me when and I always respond soon. Um, so I love, I love throwing ideas out there and, and then hearing when's about them for six months. Um, but you know, this is not, not a secret either, but um, we've had it on the roadmap for at least three months now. Um, but we just announced it last week uh, that we're rebuilding the entire Leo finance UI. Um, you know, we've, we've built an amazing interface uh, up to this point. Um, a lot of backend infrastructure that that is really key. Um, but the crazy thing, and I think, you know, we've kind of touched on this in different ways throughout this conversation, but the crazy thing in crypto is how fast paced it is, how fast paced this industry is and and the innovations that happen here. So, you know, we, we built this UI or we at least started building it about two and a half years ago. Um, and two and a half years in crypto might as well be an eternity because the technology has improved so vastly and so... Um, so relentlessly uh, that, you know, it, it kind of starts to get, you kind of start to get to the point where things look a little Frankenstein together, or at least they feel that way. Um, so a lot of times what I love to do with our team is, is uh, you know, in our, in our conversations is, you know, if we were to just rebuild this from scratch, what would, what would it look like? Um, what would we do differently? And, and how would that kind of lead into what we're doing today? Um, and in, in some time, you know, sometimes in those conversations, we actually, we actually say, you know what, we should just rebuild it from scratch. We, we come up with a lot of ideas that, that are, you know, not feasible with the current, current architecture. And, and, uh, and, and that's always fun because, because uh, then it means you get to start from zero and, and you get to, you get to incorporate a lot of things that, that you would have wanted to from the start, because now you've got the benefit of hindsight. Um, so that's kind of one of those private, not private things that were on the roadmap. Um, and, you know, what, what I love about rewrites, and, and I know you guys are, are definitely familiar with this, is that anytime you rewrite anything, you find at least 10 things that you can improve, um, you know, in, in hindsight. Every, every month that goes by, you're personally and, you know, from your developer standpoint um, and from your vision standpoint, you're, you're learning things that can better uh, better serve your vision. Um, so it, it's really important to not get too stuck in your ways. Uh, kind of like what we were talking about with, you know, what it takes to be a good founder is to be both resilient and flexible, where you can, you can look at something and say, you know what, this code is shit, we should restart from zero and, and, you know, build something better. Um, so I think that's really important. Yeah. Um, one of the other questions from the audience is, uh, and I'm going to tweak it a little bit, so if we reached peak recession in the next two years, and if the market uh, remained bear for like bearish for for long, how do you see your DAP focusing? What would you do as a founder that would uh, differentiate from other founders? And what's your uh, your your key plan 
for enduring. Uh, Joab, do you want to start with this? Sure. I mean, it's kind of what we're already doing is essentially improving upon the ecosystem that we've already built. Um, continuing to, for us, you know, Tensitopia is the flagship, right? And that's where all our tokens are emitted, all the in-game assets, essentially, are emitted. And so any game that we create afterwards is going to use the same tokens uh, in their in their in those games as well. So continuing to build upon the Tensitopia ecosystem uh, and continuing to build other games, I think it, for us, getting onto the other side of the bull market or the bear market. Uh, and into the bull market that will, I believe, you know, cement our, our future and, and, and be very beneficial for us uh, and for crypto investors uh, that invested in Tesdopia. Um, because, you know, if, it, if we're around, if we're continuing to tweak the ecosystem, if we're continuing to add new games and, uh, you know, create new avenues for different genres of players right not just you know, people that just like strategy games but you know people that like trading card games people that like uh, you know, dungeon you know like tabletop rpg type games um you know if we, if we create games that are attractive to multiple genres uh then we have our, our token being circulated and, and continue to be used and so we believe that model for us during the bear market is to create some opportunities for that to happen um and we'll keep doing what, we, what we're doing right now, uh, just building and building. Awesome. Yeah, a Adrian, do you want to chip in on this? And also, uh, a couple of people just asked a Wombat uh, specific question. So since you can't get Splinterlands in Wombat, uh, is there a way to get more high products available within the Wombat ecosystem? Um. <laughs> I'll, I'll answer that first before going on to the other, because I, I, I would forget it. Um, so actually, um, yeah, Splinterlands essentially is a Hive product. And um, that's like, I've, I've kind of, I played it when it still was called Steam Monsters, right? Um, so I've, I've known it for forever. Um, <clears throat> they, what they did though, is they, uh, they integrated, um, back in the day, they integrated the EOS blockchain for payments, although they're, um, the um, game itself is running on the Hive blockchain, right? Uh, Splinterlands basically built a Wombat login for us specifically that utilized uh, EOS so that people could actually pay with their EOS within, um, within Splinterlands. That it, I, I don't think they support it anymore, but um, the, the login is still there. So um, that's, how, that's how it's actually easy for any Wombat user to onboard into Splinterlands, right? And I think that's, um, that's a great advantage. Um, so for any other Hive-based um, project, we're curr we currently don't have plans to actually integrate the Hive blockchain itself um, kind of natively, right? Um, simply because like, we don't feel like there's enough content, um, like gaming content that would, um, that would justify this. We want to be like as lean as you can be as, <laughs> as a blockchain uh, company and as a blockchain product. So we also don't want to clutter our, um, that sounds bad, right? I, I don't want to like make it sound <laughs> bad uh, with, with regards to Hive because I love Hive, but um, it, it, like any, any blockchain that we onboard should have 10, 20 games running with it that have um, kind of a significant audience already, right? Um, and where people would actually benefit from, from yeah, having this native integration. But if, it, if it's not a native integration, we can like obviously do all kinds of things like a, a login and um, kind of a payment, uh, payment method uh, or whatever with other, uh, using other blockchains, right? Splinterlands essentially is on so many blockchains they have integrated with back then Tron, right? And then uh, Wax and EOS and, and all kinds of, of chains. So um, if as soon as you go kind of multi-chain or just, just these, like super lightweight tie-ins so that you can at least make payments. That would be great. So we could we could get your get your stuff on um, on Wombat or like ideally you would have a, a Wombat login, right? We can we can talk about all kinds of um, of po possibilities for that that can be kind of Web three based or uh, can be scatter based or like whatever standard you want to use, right? We have we have a lot. 
Um, so that that is um, that is definitely a possibility. Um, back to your question uh, regarding what to do in a bear market. Um, I think that being in the gaming space specifically with regards to crypto is actually the best the best uh, place to be when when it comes to the bear market because um, as soon as we start attracting kind of actual gamers, not yield farmers who like uh, let's say um, who just want to um, farm yield on a gaming front end, right? Which was what people did in X Infinity, for instance, right? Um, it, as soon as you actually start dealing with real gamers, it means that these people are not interested in making money necessarily, right? Um, they like getting something back. Obviously, everybody appreciates getting something back from playing a game, but they're not looking for, um, for, a, positive, for a positive ROI, right? And um, these people are, are still around. I mean, right? It, it doesn't, it, to them, a bear market doesn't matter. Um, yeah. They are interested in great content. And so long as you deliver great content and fun experiences, they will be there and they will also be willing to spend money because that's what people do, right? Traditional gamers, none of them is actually, or 99% of them are, are net positive, 99% of them are net negative on the games, right? They basically just spend money on the games. They never get any money from the games. And this will be the same thing in Web3 as well. People will be willing to be a net negative on, the, on these games so long as they provide for entertainment and fun and things that are outside of, um, of just making a quick buck, right? Um, so the the bear market, it will matter. Obviously, it will matter, but it will it, there will be ways of dealing with it uh, so long as you're in the gaming space, because there's always going to be gamers who spend money on games. Yeah, and I think that the same problem is faced with uh, blogging platforms. Uh, once you reach the user base that actually likes con consuming content and creating content instead of the like going there for the rewards is when you will actually find a, a, a mainstream adoption. So Carl, do you want to chip in on the two year winter market recession like? Yeah, I, you know, I, I think that was a, that was a really cool point about, um, you know, reaching out and finding that audience that's there, you know, not as a buyer to make money, but as a buyer because it's fun. Um, you know, I, I actually, uh, I played, you know, I, I've played a lot of different video games over the years, but the big one for me was World of Warcraft, uh, where I spent, you know, a disproportionate amount of time, you know, focused on the game, building up my character. And then, you know, I, being that I've always loved finance, uh, a big, a big thing for me was, was earning gold and, and stacking, instead of stacking sats, I was stacking gold back then. Um, so, that was a big part of the game for me. And obviously that doesn't really translate to real world uh, money. Um, and then kind of on top of that, you know, there was a, a monthly membership fee to play the game. You know, you had to pay for expansions. And uh, later on, they started adding stuff where you could, you know, buy cosmetic items, which is kind of like the big way that that games, you know, Web2 games work these days, like Fortnite, where uh, they're free to play and then have all sorts of uh, in-game in -game items that you can buy. So, you know, it's kind of... Uh, it's a really good point that that when you reach the audience of people who say play Fortnite and spend a thousand dollars on in-game items, when you can reach that audience who is willing to spend money because they love the game and it enhances their experience, uh, that's a really special thing. So, you know, relating that to blogging and and kind of social finance, which is what which is what Leo's all about. Um, you know, we are trying to target that audience that is focused on you know creating content for the sake of creating content. Um, and a lot of our focus has turned towards creating an engaging experience. Um, so like I said, you know, recently we decided, uh, basically to throw out the old UI and, and start building a, a clean slate. And a big reason for that is that we built a microblogging platform on top of what was already there. And microblogging turns out to be a lot more engaging. It turns out to be a lot more enjoyable to use outside of just creating long form, uh, blog posts, which is not as, not quite as engaging, um, and, and fun for users. So, you know, it, it is a really good point that you should create something that's fun, especially in a bear market where people aren't really making a ton of money um, and focusing on that, that really cool user experience over, you know, come here and get rich. Um, and, you know, speaking broader as, you know, like a project owner and, and founder and, and, and business operator, 
you know, I, I've talked about this a lot of times, but the key really is building out a long uh, runway where you can you can operate for several years on end, uh, despite maybe not even making any profit. Um, so if you can if you can build your business and build your you know your bank account in quotes uh, to the to the right level, you could you you should be looking at you know probably a three to five year runway where you don't need any funding uh, to keep building, and that's kind of where. You know, if you go back about, what is it, October, go back probably eight to 12 months ago, um, I started getting very concerned with, you know, the crypto market and kind of the bubbly nature of, of where we were at. Um, you know, we, we got this major influx of new users and, and new capital, and that got me very scared about the crash that would happen after. Um, and we've kind of seen that start to play out uh, these last couple of months. So what I did back then was was take a lot of crypto and and spin it out into stable coins and and you know IRL investments and uh, create a runway for for Leo Finance where we could build for you know three to five plus years even if we were expanding and hiring new devs. So whereas a lot of other projects I think in the bear market are are contracting and they're getting rid of developers and um, you know cutting back on a lot of costs, we're actually ramping up. And uh, and finding new developers and hiring them because you know this is the best time to build. Like I was saying, it's really the it's really the bear market where you can actually find developers who didn't get rich off of you know some crazy X Y Z coin um, and now they're lazy and don't want to develop. Now you can actually find people who are hungry uh, to work and and you know earn their living. And I think that's a really special thing if you can tap into it. Awesome. Uh, and just for, for the last question, and as a founder, you have to be, well, you have to have some sort of obsessed mindset and you have to be very ambitious and you, you have to have a very decisive uh, way of life. So how long did, did it take you if you already did? Uh, and how did you reach a balance between family projects and not working 20 hours a day and how how are you reaching this balance? Uh, Job, do you want to start with this? Sure, yeah. I mean, you probably hear my son crying in the background right now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually like 20 minutes before he, he actually fell in the pool when I had to jump in. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, no, so work balance is, um, I, I mean, I work from home. So our team's fully remote. I. Uh, work from home, stay close to the family. Um, I feel like putting certain limits or certain time and scheduling things uh, appropriately is really just, you know, time management's the best way to do things. Um, and uh, for me, my big work period is morning. I'm an early bird, so I get up early before anyone's awake and I'm working and, you know, by one or two, whatever, when I, when I need a break or so, you know, yeah, I spend time with the family and then in the evenings and weekends, you know, to make sure to have time for the family. Um, but I, I think scheduling it out and making, you know, uh, making time, you know, but for me, it's easy because I, I'm working from home, so I can always just pop out and just like, okay, help my son with something or, uh, my wife or something so it's like and, and just like spend time with them but um yeah I, I think in in different situations i feel like just finding the right time management and making sure that you're there because it's it's not a, it's not it's also mentally healthy you know like if you're just absorbed in the work for me at least that can cause anxiety and can cause a lot of stress and uh, I've been there working 15, 20 hour days and just like waking up in the middle of the night and uh, feeling I needed to solve the problem at like two in the morning or something. You know, it's it's going to happen uh, because you love what you're doing, but you know, you also have to find time for yourself and, and make sure that you're, you're managing everything properly. Yeah, and especially when you already have a family of your own, it's it's hard to find that that balance. Uh, Adrian, what about you? 
Um, yeah, it's hard. Um, but, I, but I think that actually being an entrepreneur and, and running your own business, that's actually the best possible lifestyle that you could have if you get it right, if you want to have a family and, 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 and a good balance between stuff that you love doing, because that's essentially what, what I do as a, as a founder, right? Um, I can choose what I want to do. I can choose what kind of direction I want to go. So I can choose the direction that I actually appreciate myself, right? And so it doesn't feel that hard to get up at five in the morning and work before the kids get up, right? Um, or um, put the kids to bed and then sit here. To me, it's almost midnight now, right? In Berlin time and, uh, and do that because it's fun. It's, it, I, I genuinely enjoy this. So I think that actually being a founder and, and um, kind of reflecting um, about what you want and what, where your priorities are and, do that, and doing that very often, doing that very regularly, that actually helps reaching that, that balance. And to me, it's the, 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 best, the best thing that I could be doing, right? So um, I, I really enjoy it. I, I enjoy both, right? I enjoyed uh, having time with my family and obviously my, my wife might, might be saying different things about <laughs> that, right? Um, but um, I, I, I really enjoy it. So, um, and I think it's, it's yeah, it's, it's great to, to combine that. Yeah, I'm not even a founder and I find it very hard to just uh, get off the computer or the home office because there's so much to do and there's there's so much you want to achieve personally and, and, and within the business. So I can't imagine how it must be for you guys with, with a big family and, and all of these ambitious plans. Uh, Carl, do you want to chip in on this? How do you, I already know about this, but for the audience, uh yeah i you know for me i don't i you know it's kind of interesting i'm um i don't really have much of a life outside of this stuff um i founded leo finance obviously and then i founded an, an irl company which kind of uh you know helps me fund a lot of this stuff as well um and you know it, it was kind of like a situation where i i started doing um, you know, the Leo finance stuff and, and realized that I, I really enjoyed operating a business, um, and building something from the ground up. And then I, I decided that I loved it so much that I went back for round two and started something else, um, to, to just make sure that I, you know, got my full, my full scoop of the medicine. Um, so, you know, I think when you love what you do, it, it really work-life balance becomes an interesting question because, um, I feel like that's more for people who say do something that they don't like to do where they feel like they need an escape. Um, I think a lot of people who work, you know, normal jobs um, or, or potentially, and, and there are plenty of people who work normal jobs that love what they do. So that's, that's not what I'm talking about, but I'm talking about people who potentially don't love what they do. Um, you know, they feel the need to have, a, you know, a ton of different hobbies and they're, you know, weekend warriors where they, you know, work all week and look forward to the weekend. Um, you know, for me, I, the weekend blends with the week and, you know, I, I love that I wake up and I get to do what I love. And, you know, uh, like Adrian was saying, when I want to make time for something else, I have the freedom and flexibility to make time for it. You know, I'm as, as an entrepreneur, I think that's a really special thing where, um, you can, you can basically do whatever you want. And, you know, that, that's really what, if you look at someone who is an entrepreneur, I think you can find a lot of different aspects of their life where you see that they desire doing whatever they want. They don't want to be told what to do. Typically they're not great at school. Um, and, uh, you know, instead of, instead of that kind of normal mindset of, of, you know, working so that you can live the life you want to live, you actually just make the life you want to live incorporated into what you do. Um, so for me, that's, that's super important. Um, I do spend a lot of time working, but to me, it's uh, it, it's more of a it, it feels like a hobby, even though it is work. Awesome, yeah. <clears throat> uh, well, I think that's that's about it. Uh, but do you have anything you want to add? Maybe tell the audience uh, one last piece of advice. Not 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 regarding uh, that creation. Not regarding uh, founding a company, but. If you could uh, 
put a life advice in just one phrase, uh, what what would you tell them? And Adrian, uh, you have the spotlight. I would tell them it's still early. Just get on it. Just do it. Uh, it sounds stupid, but uh, this is this is what what needs to be done. We need a lot more people who who love doing stuff, who love being creative. Here, there's plenty of opportunity, um, and we're still early, so just get it on. Go. Yeah, I, I'd say stay curious and uh, turn your your hobby into your, your career. I think. Yeah, I mean, these things sound really cheesy, and, and, and <laughs> but you know they're possible, and it's 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 it's. Uh, I feel like what Web three is doing is allowing you know people to to find gaming to be their career path, and and we're seeing um, it happening in emerging countries, and I, I think it'll be something that happens you know. Um, Across U.S. and, and Europe in, in due time, as, as crypto and Web3 becomes more prevalent. So I, I believe, you know, as a founder, if you want to found something with an idea, great, a good idea, you know, keep pursuing it and find out ways to to really make that your your career. Yeah, if I could, uh, if I could synthesize what I feel like everyone is saying is, uh, do what you love until you love what you do. Awesome. Thanks everyone for uh, for tuning in and thanks everyone who's uh, listening to this later on. We hope to have uh, Job and Adrian later when this show has 100,000 viewers. Um, yeah, thank you guys. I'll see you next Thursday for the third episode of uh, Chain Chatter. Thanks a lot. Thanks guys. Okay. Yeah, so recording is off.